What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to the channel. So this video is going to start off a series, well it's going to be basically in the R5 tips and tricks and R5C tips and tricks series, but this is a little bit more generic than that and we're going to start off a series talking about white balance and white balancing in digital cameras and kind of more in general. So let's dive right in. Uh, the first thing that you might be asking about the whole white balance process and all of that, and what even is white balance and white balancing a as a whole. So put simply, white balancing is the process of adjusting an image's colors so that the color casts that are created by different colored white light sources are removed. And basically white is white, gray is gray, blue is blue, and the colors are pure, uh, untinted or unadulterated colors. I mean, the first question you might be asking is, well, how can you have different colored white light sources? Isn't white white? Sort of. But when we talk about lighting, white light ends up being a, a range of differently toned, for lack of a better way to put it, sources. So you have everything all the way down from the bottom, uh, the warm end of the color spectrum in like tungsten, all the way up to the cool end of the color spectrum in daylight. So warm and cool, meaning warm has more yellow or amber in it. So tungsten light is more yellow and cool meaning has more blue in it. So daylight renders light that has more blue compared to say tungsten. Now in the real world, our brains do a tremendously good job at removing these kinds of color casts from the world as we see it and adjusting our perception of reality so that the colors are perceived relatively true. Like if we know something's a white piece of paper, it doesn't matter what kind of light source we're talking about, or at least white light source we're talking about, we'll perceive it as being white. So color balancing or white balancing is basically the same process, but doing it on our camera because if we were to take a picture in, say, a tungsten lit environment that we had our camera set up for daylight color balance, the picture would be incredibly yellow. And while our brains are great at fixing up that color in our perception of the world around us, if we were to take that picture and show it to somebody, well, their brain isn't going to process the yellow out of a picture. It may be able to process that out of the world around them, but for a picture, it's still just going to be a yellow picture. So that's why we want to do this. We want to make sure that we don't have color casts from the white light in our environment negatively impacting our image and potentially making things really bad. Knowing that, the next question you might be wondering about is how accurate, how much do you need to care about getting white balance right, especially in camera, and how accurate do you need the white balance to be for things to just work right? Well, when you think about this, there's really two considerations that come down, at least from a technical side of things. What image format are you shooting in and how much accuracy is required in the project or that you're working on? So let me start with number two, how much accuracy is required? Well, this is gonna depend on what you're doing with the pictures. If, for example, you are taking pictures just to show friends and family where you are, having really accurate color balance or white balance is really not going to be that important. Now, we're all photographers or cinematographers here, so nobody's gonna ever say that having inaccurate white balance is a good thing. Uh, just the level of standard that you have to achieve and how far you need to go to go about doing it isn't going to be necessarily that high. Now, on the other hand, if you are shooting products for a advertising campaign or something like that, that's where you will probably need to have really accurate color and really accurate white balance. And where in that first case, you might just set your camera to auto white balance and take the pictures and send them to somebody and not really worry about it because the camera's probably gonna get things close enough. In this latter case of product photography, you may be shooting color check cards for reference uh, color references, and you may be shooting with a white balance target like over here to properly white balance that image in, the, in full as accurately as you can get it. Now, all of that comes back to that question about image format. 
Are you shooting in RAW or are you shooting in JPEG? Because this ultimately becomes a huge arbiter of really just how accurate you need to be. And to understand this, we need to talk a little bit about image, how image format or images, uh, these image formats work. So if you're shooting in RAW, what your camera is going to do is going to collect the sensor information directly from your sensor and it's going to stick it in a file. And along with it in that file, it's going to process a, a copy of that information into a JPEG thumbnail so that you have some idea of what the picture will look like. And it's going to stick that in the file. And then right along with that is going to be a whole bunch of metadata. So this will include things like the camera model, serial number, the lens you're using, focal length, aperture, ISO, f-stop, all of that kind of stuff. And in our case, the important bit, the, the white balance. Now, this could be if you're shooting an auto white balance, the white balance that the camera calculated or determined that the scene should be shot in, or if you've specified a white balance on your camera, that white balance that you specified. But in no point does the camera take that raw sensor information and process it into anything else. That's the job for your post-processing software, so Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One, whatever. Even if you're shooting raw video, whatever ed, uh, NLE you're working in, that's its job to deal with. The camera doesn't do any of that. Now, as a result, there is no white balance adjustment baked into the image that you shoot. So you could quite literally shoot a, with your camera set to a white balance of 10,000 K and uh, Kelvin and your scene lit with at 2,500 Kelvin, basically the diametrically opposed ends of the white balance settings that most cameras support go into your post-processing workflow, drag the white balance slider over, and that overrides anything that the camera saved and recalculates the image or calculates the image. It doesn't even recalculate it for the first time with that correct white balance. Now, what happens if you're shooting in non-RAW formats? Because this is where things become much more important to get right in camera. So when I talk about non-RAW formats, I'm talking about things like JPEG and HEIF, and if you're a Nikon user, TIFF for stills, and anything in video that's compressed with AVC or HEVC, or even high-res or high-end codecs like ProRes and DNxHR. Basically, if it doesn't say RAW, it's gonna work like what I'm describing here. If it does say raw, even if it's a video format, it works like raw still images. What the camera does with these files is it starts off the same way as it does with the raw, except instead of shoving that raw sensor data into the file for something to deal with later, the camera will do all of the processing that your computer would have been doing with the raw sensor data. Ultimately, what this means is that your camera is going to bake all of these color adjustments, including the white balance, into the pixel values of the image that it delivers. Which means if you have to make an adjustment in post, you're making an adjustment to something that's already set in stone, essentially. So it's not a rewrite of what the camera would thought should it, it should be, you know, ignore what the camera thought and do what we want to do. That's what raw is with non raw formats. The camera already baked that in. Now we're doing a manipulation to the image. And once you start going down that road, you start running into some limitations. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of limitations here that restrict just how much you can, uh, or how much leeway you have for getting the white balance wrong and then fix it up in post. Some of that has to do with the compression. Some of that has to do with a reduction in the bit depth that the image has in compressed form. And some of that has to do with the fact that you're doing additional math mathematical manipulations on top of the base image that you didn't have in the original. So that's why we have to do white balancing and kind of how the much you have to worry about doing the white balancing. Let's talk a little bit about some terminology that comes up when you start dealing with white balancing. So the first term I wanna hit is Kelvin. Now, if you remember back to your high school chemistry or physics class, you probably will remember that Kelvin is a measure of temperature and that zero Kelvin is absolute zero, the coldest temperature that can possibly exist. So you might be wondering why would we use or be talking about temperature when we're talking about color? 
what does that have to do with anything? Well, the answer to that has to do with the way most of the light that's around us is produced and historically has been produced. And that's through a process called black body radiation or Planckian radiation. And that's a really fancy scientific way of saying, if you take something and you get it really hot, it glows. And the color of the light that it produces when it's glowing is directly controlled by the temperature of that thing that you got it to. It doesn't matter what material it's made out of. It doesn't matter what color it was before you heated it. All that matters is how hot you got it. And this applies to all kinds of sources around us. So if you take, for example, a candle flame or a campfire flame, those, the, the warm orange red color that you get from those flames is due to the fact that carbon particles coming off of the fuel have been heated and are hot enough that they're actually glowing and emitting that color. Another perfect example of this is the old school tungsten light. So if you look at one of those old school lamps, inside the envelope, you will find a little metal uh, coil. Now that wire is made from the material tungsten, which is why the lights are called tungsten lights. And the whole light works by that piece of metal getting hot and glowing. So when you pass a current through the light, the piece of tungsten in the lamp heats up, heats up to color temperature or the temperature that it is rated at in terms of color temperature. So a household incandescent light might heat up to around 2,800 Kelvin. A photo light, a tungsten photo flood or photo lamp will heat up to around 3,200 Kelvin or even in some cases, 3,500 Kelvin. And of course, the source of light that most of us use most of the time is the sun. And while the actual processes that make the sun work are, you know, fusion and all that kind of jazz, the ultimate emission of light that we have see is largely dictated by this Planckian or black body process. So the photosphere, the part of the sun that emits light that we see, has a effective temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. Now, of course, we don't set our cameras to 5,800 Kelvin here on Earth. We set it to 55 or 5,200 Kelvin. And the reason for that is because there's an atmosphere between us and the sun. And the atmosphere absorbs some of the blue light, which makes the output look or the color look warmer. And so that's why we end up using 52 to 5,500 Kelvin, depending on where the sun is and the time of the day and so on and so forth. So that's Kelvin, and that's why we use temperature to talk about color. The next term I want to talk about is myriad. Now, if you're an old school film photographer or you came from the lighting world before everybody had bicolor LED lights and you just turned a dial and the light changed color, then you probably have already heard myreds and are already familiar with it. But if you are not of that era of photographer, then you probably haven't really heard this term that much. So MIRID stands for micro reciprocal degree. And you'll find it also in some manuals for some devices stated as reciprocal mega Kelvin or capital M capital K to the minus one. That is the official term in the SI unit system as opposed to MIRED. Now that said, in the vast majority of cases with photography stuff, you will probably see my red. Uh, however, I have noticed in some color uh, sensor manuals or color meter manuals that they talk in reciprocal me mega Kelvin instead of my reds, just as a point of thing to be aware of. Now, converting between Kelvin and my reds is super easy. It's a million divided by the color temperature in Kelvin. So if you have a 3200 Kelvin light source and you wanna see what that is in my reds, a million divided by 3,200 is approximately 313. If you have a 5,600 Kelvin light source and you want to see what that is in my reds, well, a million divided by 5,600 is approximately 179. Now, the reason my reds get used and the reason I'm talking about them is they express a color change in a consistent way. So if you have a color filter that has a minus 10 my red shift, which would be a 10 my red shift towards blue, then the color that that filter will produce when you put it over a light 
is going to be directly related to the color of the light source that you are filtering. It's not, it, and this doesn't work in the, necessarily in the way you might expect if you're thinking like, oh, well, you know, it's a hundred Kelvin shift in the color temperature. So if you have a 3200 Kelvin source, which would be tungsten, and you put a 10 Myrid cooling filter on it, that'll actually only make it a 3300 Kelvin source. So 100 Kelvin difference. On the other hand, if you have a 5500 Kelvin source and you put the same 10 Myrid cooling filter on it, that'll change the color temperature to 5920 Kelvin. So almost 6000 Kelvin, which is a much bigger change if you're talking about Kelvin than if you were talking about it's the same Myrid shift. Now, why do we use this? In, uh, instead of Kelvin? Well, for starters, if you're talking about coloring lights or gelling lights, it allows us to describe a gel in a way that doesn't require us to describe a starting point. Uh, the other property of this uh, that we run into most often is when doing adjustments to color balance on a camera. So if you're making fine adjustments, you're going to make adjustments in Myred because it's going to stack on top of the color temperature that you set the camera at. So again, it gives you a consistent unit to make adjustments with, and this has historically also been what's used for filters. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about in this video is the white balance adjustment axes. Uh, so typically when we start doing white balance adjustments or when we talk about white balance, we are going to talk about it in two different uh, axes. You could think of plotting colors on an XY graph. And on this graph, the two axes typically are the color temperature on the horizontal, which is going to be amber to blue of essentially white light. And Perpendicular to that, in the y-axis, typically we will be talking about shifts made to color tone or a green or magenta adjustment. And this is historically how color filters for cameras, color filters for lights have all been sort of art, uh, oriented. So if you had daylight film and a certain color light source, you would use the amber blue axis to adjust the color temperature in Kelvin, and then the green magenta axis uh, to adjust the uh, offset basically from, or how much green or magenta ended up being in that adjustment or from the light so that you didn't have any green or magenta cast. Now, as I said, the adjustments in the color temperature axis are almost always going to be in Myred or fractions of a Myred or multiples of Myred. The adjustments in the color uh, tone axis, the green magenta axis, frequently will not actually be described in your camera's manual or in a light as to what you're actually adjusting. You'll just have three points of green or two points of magenta or something to that effect. Other places you'll see these described as diffuse density units, which unfortunately I don't have a really good explanation as to how to understand or sort of conceptualize these. Now, the unfortunate side is, is that with some things being in diffuse density units and other things being in points that don't have any corresponding adjustment, it becomes very difficult to know what exactly you're, how much of an adjustment you're actually making. So if you measure something and then you're trying to make an adjustment on your camera based on the measurements from a color meter, uh, depending on what brand camera you're using, you can run into some challenges with that. So with that said, I'm going to wrap this up here. This is, of course, the fundamentals. In future videos, we'll be talking about camera settings and how to make settings and how to actually set white balance and a whole variety of things like that. Uh, but for the moment, I hope you found this useful or at least interesting. If you did, let me know by hitting that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. Finally, if you'd like to help support this channel and future videos like this directly, please consider hitting that thanks button that's down below the video. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.